Okay, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome back Fyodor Drivas from Stony Brook University, and he will give part three of his mini course on mathematical aspects of turbulence. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, I'm gonna just begin by um, making a remark that connects what I've been talking about the last two lectures to um, maybe something everybody has heard of this minus five thirds law. I, I mentioned it just in passing, but I think it's worth some extra remark. So in everything we've been talking about, we've mainly been discussing structure functions. So these are objects like this. They are um, velocity increments, so the velocity at two different points. Here, square integrated over the domain in x, and then in this case, averaged over direction. And this increment is a function now of just the magnitude of this vector. L. And in the inertial range of turbulence, as we've seen, this object has a certain scaling behavior. Namely, it goes like a power law with a certain exponent. And empirically, that exponent is close to two thirds. So here's a log plot. So a straight line on a log plot means that this thing goes like L to the two thirds. And here you can see this range, this inertial range where this behavior happens. Now, there's a <clears throat> frequency space analog of this. And this is the famous sort of energy spectrum. So here's one way you can define it. You just, the uh, energy spectrum is the sum over wave numbers and you fix the shell. So you're averaging over a shell. So this is the magnitude and here's this shell of P that has that magnitude of the Fourier transform um, at frequency K square. And now this object is also observed to have power law type scaling in the inertial range, and the number is minus five thirds. So here you can see a plot of that, and in the you know comparable range you see a, a comparable behavior, but it's going the other way and it's a different number. Okay, so there's a very simple relationship between these two things. Um, if you have this function, so so essentially these are related by a Fourier transform, and so if this function behaves like L to a given power, then the spectrum behaves like K to a complementary power, and the relationship is written there. Uh, the important case here is when this number S is equal to one third, so that this is two thirds. And then when you plug in, you find exactly minus five thirds. So that is to say, everything we've been talking about is actually directly related to what we've um, what you've heard about in terms of the Kolmogorov scaling. Um, and just, just a, an extra remark, uh, this number one third for S, we also saw it comes up as this Ansager critical exponent that tells you uh, what's the maximal regularity the fluid can possess um, uh, to be consistent with anomalous dissipation, this robust experimental observation. And that was, it can't have more than a third of a derivative. Um, and Kolmogorov 1941 theory essentially asserts that the number of derivatives you have in LP is independent of P. So that prediction at the level of the second, so Ansager precisely is for L3, if you measure the regularity in L3 sense, but this is a statement about L2 and Kolmogorov theory connects them. So the, the reason why Kolmogorov predicts two thirds for this object is really the same reason that Ansager predicted one third. Okay, is the connection more clear now? So, but could you kind of summarize so how this power law comes from this scaling axioms? So you, there is this homogeneity and self similarity axioms, and somehow they are responsible for such a power loss. So what is the summary? So just to, uh, is it possible in one, in one minute well, to give the summary of that? Right. So in, in his statistical theory, Kolmogorov was describing functions that essentially have this character. So they have a certain self-similarity, they're homogeneous and isotropic. And so if you compute on such an object what this is, uh, it would have a power loss scaling, in fact, over all scales. But um, Kolmogorov also recognized that there should be a dissipative cutoff, so this scaling should only be in a range sufficiently large. 
that cutoff as the Reynolds numbers increased go to zero. So ideal turbulence in that view would be occupying all scales with this type of parallel behavior. Now, that behavior is not a priori proved or even a priori true from, the, um, from what's observed about real turbulence, but it is directly related to these theorems about constraints on solutions consistent with things that we do observe to be true. I'm not sure if that's... Uh... So what I was saying is that essentially this power laws are kind of obvious consequence of the homogeneity and self-similarity axioms. Um, right. So the, the fact that there would be a power law is an obvious consequence. The, the non-trivial thing is to say what number should the power law correspond to. And that's where uh, the essentially the um, connection between the dissipative anomaly comes in. So within his theory, the, you can compute essentially what is the flux of energy through scale for this type of random field with these properties. And it's only when the exponent is exactly one third here that you get the flux is non-vanishing and it can match a positive dissipation rate. Otherwise, within that theory, the flux would either be infinite or zero. So, it's a, so that's what sets the theoretical value in his theory. So the flux should be counterbalanced by the dissipation rate? That's right, yeah. In the right scale, in that yes. Kalmogorov scale. So what is a good source for this kind of ideas? I, I think the book by Uriel Frisch is a very good Frisch reference book. for this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. thanks. Okay. Okay. Um, are there any other questions about this before we move on? Um, oh. Okay. So, uh, now, in this lecture, I want to talk about examples of the phenomena in various different situations. None of them will be direct examples for real turbulence, but they will all touch tangentially to different aspects and we can learn more from them. So the first set of examples I'd like to discuss um, are typically called something like the flexible side of the Ansager conjecture. And the words here that go with this are convex integration, and um, there are many names. So let me state a, a final theorem in this direction about weak solutions of the Euler equation. So this theorem was finally proved by Phil Isett in, in 2018, but there's a long history that I'll talk about in just one second. And actually, as written, the statement was proved in this paper by Buckmaster, Delelis, Seklahiri, and Vico. So the statement is this. Let E just be any smooth, strictly positive function. This is going to represent the behavior of the energy in time. Um, then for any alpha, exponent alpha, between 0 and 1 third, strictly less than 1 third, there exists a weak solution of the Euler equations, which is C alpha, Holder, C, it's Holder continuous with exponent alpha in space and time, um, which has the property that if you compute the energy on that solution, it matches exactly this prescribed function E. So in particular, you can start with zero, could just be a trivial solution. They can all of a sudden start moving and then it can, you know, um, not go below zero, of course, but then it can go back to zero. Could be compactly supported in space and time. And so this is a really striking flexibility statement about the Euler equation. It says that, you know, uh, first of all, you can have solutions that are completely unphysical in the sense that they start zero and then start moving and then go back to zero. But more than that, there's a huge degree of non-uniqueness. And this degree is parameterized by this family of functions here. Um, so, the, and of course, the, the statement is final in the sense that this one-third exponent is the Ansager one-third exponent. You know, if you were just above it, you couldn't have this behavior, um, at least in terms of prescribing energy that could go up and down at will. Um, there is an issue of the endpoint case, um, but let's not 
let's not dwell on that issue here. Okay, so just some words about the history. The, the first such construction of a compactly supported um, uh, solution was by Schaeffer in 1993, and this was really a breakthrough work. And then there was work of Schnurlman that actually produced dissipative solutions and really set the groundwork for these later convex integration schemes. Um, and uh, then a, a big part of this story is a program by Delelis and Seklahidi which systematically tried to increase the exponents. So Schnurlman's construction was just finite energy. It didn't have any Holder regularity whatsoever, same with Schaeffer. But then these guys uh, started a program to essentially uh, give more regularity to these solutions that were constructed. And, okay, there are some Buckmaster, Dalela, Seklahidi, just continue to improve this exponent up until this final statement that's written above. And so the idea behind these constructions are based on this Nash-Cooper theorem and Gromov's H principle. And there are some really great reviews that discuss these connections at length. I'll just point to two. There's one by Buckmaster V. Cole very recently. And then there's a slightly older one, but very good by Delelis and Seklahidi. Um, okay, but in, in the next slide or two, I'd like to just give a very top level perspective of, of what goes into proving such a theorem and try to connect it with some ideas that may be similar to those in a normalization group. And this perspective, at least, I know it from um, some presentations of Uriel Frisch, who's thought about this more recently. <clears throat> so the construction is somehow an inverse renormalization group procedure. Namely, you start with some object that's living at a certain scale, and then you build another object by adding higher frequencies, smaller scales, until you come to some sort of final, um, uh, final theory, if you will. So let's try to be a bit more precise. The construction has a number of stages. Let's call them stages S0, S1, SQ, and so on. So going, and to, these... going to smaller scales, you call universal normalization. That's what it's... Uh, I mean, it's it, yeah. So it's <laughs> this is actually a term he he introduced. Well, in say context. something about this. This is a recurrent theme, and I was even going to write Misha a note this morning. <laughs> it's just that uh, yes, I, I just... renormalization. It, it it depends on your perspective. If you're talking about points and measures, then the way you think about it is renormalization means go to finer scales. If you're talking about functions on points, like functions of measures, that's the dual picture. And the covariant arrow turns around. And so you go from fine scales to coarse scales by averaging. And I'm, this has been bothering me in all, in all these discussions of the lecture. And I, you know, like last time I said, the map X goes to X bar is renormalization. That's the way that goes from fine to coarse because they're talking about functions on the geometry. And you and in, in, in the renormalization that you and I have worked on, we're talking about the points and the dynamics. And so it, it <coughs> looks like you're going to finer scales, but it's the same thing, I claim. And that's been confusing me for a couple of years, actually, in, in something else I've been doing. Yeah. Okay. That's what I want to say that. Okay, Dennis. Yeah. So you're checking that he's doing. I'm, I'm checking, yes. No, I'm, I'm aware. I, I claim that. You're covariant and he's contravariant. That's all. There's it's a it's a natural discussion, but we'll have to talk about it outside the lecture. But I claim there's an automatic resolution, a Bourbaki resolution of this. Okay. okay. I'm not kidding either. <laughs> <laughs> but... Okay. Um, right. So these stages you're adding. Um, I mean, in general, they'll involve motions that are at increasingly small scale here in this geometric progression. So say you start at two, scale 2 pi, and then you add things at scale 2 pi over 2 and so on, 2 pi over 2 to the q. Um, and at each stage, you obtain a solution of this system here in, in yellow. So we've seen this system before. It's, it's just a system you get from applying some sort of filtering, a projection to the equation. And 
this term here, uh, which is sometimes called the Reynolds stress term in the fluid literature, otherwise it's just the cumulant, as Dennis said last time, is the error from the commutation of this procedure with the nonlinearity. And here, let's just think for simplicity of U bar as representing keeping only Fourier modes less than um, this scale L to uh, the power minus one. And we can think of L as two to the minus Q. Okay. So the goal of these constructions is to show that this force on the Euler equation, so this is the Euler equation, here's the force, that this force actually goes to zero uh, in a weak sense as Q goes to infinity. If you do so, then the resulting object is going to be a weak solution of the Euler equation. Okay. So e each one of these stages involves essentially three steps. Uh, the first step is to coarse grain. So you take the output from the previous stage and you just apply this spectral cutoff or filter. And so now whatever came from the last stage is, is living at the scale set by the next stage. So you just cut out anything that's smaller than the scale LQ defining the next stage. Now, the result of doing so will give you an approximate solution to the Euler equation with some force. And that force might be larger than you would like. So um, one method that people have employed to reduce the error of that force is to actually take the result of projecting, so the result of step one, and to flow it by the Euler equation for some short time. Okay, and if you flow it by the Euler equation, suddenly the the resulting thing is closer to being a solution of the of Euler. And so, the way that it's it's flowed, and um, is is like this. So you have an associated time scale to the spatial scale uh, uh, of motion at the step. So this L is going to be, again, like two to the minus Q is L. And there's also an associate, was there a question? Yeah. Okay, there's also an associated fluctuation of the velocity, how much the velocity is varying at that scale. And I'm just gonna call it delta U. In these constructions, Delta U is going to behave like L to some power H. H will be related to the Holder exponent of the Euler solution in the limit. But at the moment, I'll keep it general. You just have this, which is dimensionally a time. And this time depends on which stage you are. Um, it's going to speed up as you go further into the stages. Okay. And now what you do is you take your interval zero t where you want to construct the solution of the Euler equation and you break it up into these times and you evolve as a Cauchy problem you so you, you have you know you have from step one an object you, you trace it at these times and then you evolve backward and forward in time using the Euler dynamics um, and get some solution in this region here and, and let's say this is like two-thirds of the interval so you go like two thirds and two thirds. Here you do the same two thirds and two thirds. And you have this like uh, uh, overlapping cover of this interval zero T, which corresponds to where you're evolving from, from those uh, particular points in time. Now there's this region of overlap. And in this region of overlap, you have to figure out a way to glue these things together to make as little error as possible so that you can actually achieve something that has a smaller force. And this is a big technical uh, difficulty. Um, there's many difficulties here, but this is schematically what, what's going on in those steps. Excuse me, and, how do you yeah. evolve, excuse me. How, yeah. How do you evolve Euler's equation when you only have a holder velocity? Oh, no, no, everything is smooth at any given step. So remember it's even filtered, it's projected. Um, so oh. the, the, the limit is holder, but at each step, it's like a C infinity thing. Okay. Yeah. But so uh, I, I don't understand. So you're gluing together two solutions of the equation to obtain again a solution of the equation. So somehow so, it's yeah. completely impossible. Oh, no. 
so so essentially um you you are so on this interval zero to t step one gives you some object okay it just gives you some velocity field on that interval and now we want to improve that velocity field to make it closer to being a solution and the idea in doing this is you divide that time interval time interval up into periods and uh, so, at these uh, i see so what? you go from scales to scale so so you give a you make approximation at certain scale and then you glue with approximation in the next scale or some, something like that you go to the next scale there yeah is, so is time it's scale approximation. it's a construction it's a construction yeah which has a so yeah, yeah in, in, so essentially in these overlap okay in these overlap regions um, you know, if you evolve backwards from here, you get one thing. If you evolve forwards from here, you get something else. But in these overlap regions, you want to somehow find the right interpolant to go c continuously from, you know, smoothly from here to there and make as little error as possible. So in, in evolving in these regions, you, you, you help to re reduce the error. But then there's this issue about the overlap, and that's something you have to deal with in the construction. That's what the gluing. Okay. Um, and then finally, there's uh, the, the most important step in this construction, which is to add a uh, small scale perturbation. So you've done this, you've done this um, time evolution and gluing, you've reduced the error in doing so. And now you want to reduce the error even more by adding um, uh, uh, some building block type objects to uh, the result of step two that are designed to cancel uh, as much of the remaining force as you can. So a big part of um, these constructions is finding the right building blocks uh, to both reduce the stress, so to be able to reduce the stress, make the force smaller, and simultaneously to be easy enough to work with and controllable so that you don't introduce many other errors when you when you put them into the solution. And so uh, a big um, a, a big uh, breakthrough in this was the use of what are called Mankato flows. These are like little pipes and the, the velocity is just in the direction here and it's compactly supported to the blue region and you can put them so that they don't intersect in 3D and you have some kind of network like this. And they're, you know, you can basically they generate a stress so that when you plug them in, you can design them by changing their amplitudes to cancel whatever your, your previous error was from the, the last step to some approximation. I mean, you can't do it exactly. And um, um, basically making sure this whole thing converges and you get a weak solution in the limit and balancing everything so that you keep some regularity is is the the whole game in this type of analysis. Okay. Yeah, are those are those uh, literally just shear flows? Yeah, I mean they're, they're, they're like little tiny pipe flows. Yeah, in here they're like shear flows in there inside the pipe. Okay, so um just some remarks. Uh, this procedure is highly under constrained. There's a lot of arbitrariness in what you do. And this is actually the reason why you can, first of all, prescribe whatever energy profile you like. Um, um, and also the reason why at each step, it's, it's easy to do the construction. Um, and uh, okay, each the iteration process introduced these high wave number oscillations to cancel the old stress, I, I said that. And the difficulty is, again, choosing the right perturbations to add so that you don't introduce uncontrollable errors. And this is, I think, one of the major technical difficulties in doing what I've described. Now, just some re remarks about the solutions you get. So the solutions are what you would call monofractal in the sense that the velocity has just one holder exponent through the domain h. And that number can be just less than one third. So from a certain point of view, they have Komogorov-like behavior. So the 
the regularity if you measure in any LP for those solutions is essentially a third. And I say Kolmogorov like behavior have because one older exponent. Oh, I, so I think last time in the lecture, uh, there was this point that was mentioned that the Holder exponent could depend on where you are in space and time. And that, that type of spottiness was called intermittency, is related to intermittency. And that's not true of these constructions. Yeah, but what's the precise statement here? Uh, on a fractal, what does it mean? So, let, okay, let's just... Let's just say like this, that if you measure how many derivatives it has in any LP, uh, that number is the same. It's, it's one third and not better. Okay. So I, I say Komogorov like spectra because actually in constructing these solutions, you introduce frequencies at this geometric progression of wave numbers. And that means that the resulting energy spectrum will, will have large gaps. In fact, ever growing gaps as, as the frequencies get higher. And what's observed in turbulence is that the spectrum is a well-populated thing. It's sort of a continuous function. And so although they have a, a property that's similar to turbulence in the sense that the derivative is the same number in any LP. Nevertheless, they don't really look like turbulence. And I want to mention one recent exception to the last point, which was a, a very recent paper from like last week or something by this group, Buckmaster, Masmoudi, Novak, and Vicol. They constructed, and I'm just giving a very uh, sort of uh, very rough statement to make the conceptual point. They constructed solutions that have bigger than one third of a derivative in L2 and less than one third of a derivative in L3. And so these are solutions that are intermittent in the sense that we were talking about last time. So this is towards a more uh, a description of a more realistic flow, but there remain many problems in connecting these constructions to actual turbulent behavior. Um, for one, again, there's this uh, arbitrariness of the energy profile. So these constructions are not uh, dissipative. I mean, they're not forced to be dissipative. And as such, there's no way to connect them to inviscid limits, which would have to be dissipative. Um, what they do teach us is that if you think about weak solutions of Euler by themselves, and you had hoped that in parallel with, say, the theory of uh, one-dimensional hyperbolic conservation laws, you had hoped that uh, a weak solution with a certain property like dissipation would be predictive. That's not true here. I mean, the non-uniqueness is to such a degree that it seems like there's no obvious admissibility criterion to even meaningfully reduce the number of solutions that you can construct by these procedures. So it's a... a can, do this, can you do this for any smooth initial condition? So you can, yeah, you can start with zero, for example. Um, and okay, I don't, any smooth initial condition, I'm, I'm not 100% sure. There are probably people in the audience who would be able to answer that. But you, for example, you can start with zero and, and perfectly smooth and nice and then go to something like this hold there one third at time one. Yeah, but I, I, that's, that's not what I want to know. I want to know, see it. I mean, it sounds like if you could do this with any initial condition, you could start saying, take these solutions for all time, which you have greater, you know, positive number of derivatives in L3, then in particular, they're in L3. Then you can start adding a little diffusion term to get the Navier-Stokes equation, and you would get a theorem that says for small viscosity, you have unique solutions for Navier-Stokes, smooth solutions. Because as soon as you're in one third with a little bit of viscosity, you have long time existence and it's of strong solutions. Uh, so maybe we can talk more about that later. I'm not sure I really understand, but maybe let's talk about that afterwards. Okay. Okay, so now I want to talk about models that do include uh, viscosity. And there are 
two types of models that I'll talk about. One is the Burkers equation, which is a nonlinear equation. And the next is going to be a linear model of motion of die in a given velocity field. So the Burgers equation is actually a compressible model. It's in one dimension. And um, it was introduced at first by Burgers as a toy model for understanding uh, Navier-Stokes at small viscosity. And so here it's, it's written without any forcing. It's just the same type of fluid nonlinearity we've seen before and uh, Laplacian type dissipation. And so to begin with, let's just make first some remarks about solution theory. So when viscosity is positive, this model is globally well posed. You have a unique smooth solution starting from smooth data. When viscosity is zero, this model shocks in finite time. So the Euler counterpart has finite time singularity formation. The Navier-Stokes counterpart is global. And you've probably all seen what solutions to this equation look like. So you might start with something like a sinusoidal type profile. And this equation steepens this derivative here. So it starts to look more like this ramp structure. And then at a certain moment for the, for the inviscid model, a shock is formed and it's a jump discontinuity is formed at this point. So just like the beach. <laughs> yeah, just like, yeah, just like wave breaking on the beach. And then they break. Yeah. And, um, okay, so now, now one question you can ask is what happens to the energy dissipation after the shock forms? And does it display this anomalous characteristic of turbulence? And of course, the answer in this model is yes. And there's a very nice 1D exact solution, uh, this sawtooth solution, which can allow you to compute the dissipation explicitly. So the sawtooth solution takes this form, has this hyperbolic tangent here. And the asymptotics of this, if you go to large values of this argument, either by sending nu to zero or x to infinity, this converges to um, this profile here. It's just piecewise linear. Looks like that. So x plus l over t, x minus l over t. Okay, and there is a singularity at time zero, but you, that's not a that's not a, an important point. You can start at time slightly later than zero. So this is an analytical solution of the nonlinear Burgers equation, and it displays a shock in the inviscid limit, as you send viscosity to zero, you just have a shock sitting at zero for all time. And so along this limit, you can compute the dissipation due to viscosity, let's call that epsilon. And this, from this formula, just takes this form here, okay? And so what we learn from that form is that if you, if you, if you imagine at some finite viscosity the sawtooth solution looks like this. Here's the velocity. The dissipation is a very well localized uh, thing right in a neighborhood of where the shock is going to form. And in the limit, as viscosity goes to zero, it actually converges in the sense of distributions to a Dirac delta sitting at zero with an amplitude, which is delta U cubed divided by one, uh, divided by 12. Okay, so there is anomalous dissipation in this model and in fact, it has this cubic form as it must from this nonlinear flux. In this case, the cubic form is very simple because the nonlinear flux happens at one point and its strength is just related to this jump discontinuity of the limiting shock. Um, and so everything that we said before about Euler and it was conjectural here in this model is, you know, just in this particular solution is just easy and trivial to compute. Now, a couple of remarks about this behavior. The first is that it's actually general. So nearby, sort of asymptotically close as you send viscosity to zero, um, uh, nearby a point where the shock is going to form, a, a, gener a generic shock will start to look like this profile in a neighborhood, again, in the limit as viscosity goes to zero. So. In fact, this is what happens. And 
more than that, what you have is convergence in this inviscid limit towards a weak solution, but this weak solution is also what's known as an entropy solution. So the energy is being dissipated and that energy is related to an entropy flux pair of this equation as a hyperbolic conservation law in 1D. So this is an entropy solution of the equation and you have uniqueness of entropy solutions. So you have that, first of all, those solutions are necessarily dissipative and they can exist, glo they exist globally in time for the Burgers equation and they just lose energy. Okay. So can you yeah. uh, define an entropy solution again? Yeah, so an entropy solution is a distributional solution of the conservation law. So this equation can be put in conservation form. This term is just one half dx u square. Uh, for some reason, my u square. And so you can define a weak solution for this equation. And an entropy solution is uh, one for which, in this case, uh, the, the energy, which is, again, one half u square, is non-increasing in time. So that is known for this equation to be a uniqueness criteria. In fact, it follows from a general theory of equations of the form like this, where you have a possibly nonlinear flux here that's yeah. different than u squared. Energy non decreasing. Energy is non non increasing. Non increasing. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. But yeah. Okay. So we can actually learn much more from Burgers, even these simple examples, uh, about intermittency and how we could think about that. So first of all, if you have countably many shocks and they're exhibiting these jump discontinuities along the shock, uh, at the shock points, the solutions, these entropy solutions, live in this space. So what this is saying is that First of all, uniformly in time, they're bounded, and they're also bounded variation. Okay, and being bounded in bounded variation actually means that you, in LP, you have one over p derivatives. It's very easy to see that this is true of a general function in this class. Um, this is but, in one dimension, right? In, in one yeah, this is yeah, this is in this is in one dimension, and in fact, for the actual burger solutions, you can show that they're also not better than it's exactly, they have exactly this behavior. So we'll see that right here. Um, so the example from the previous page, the entropy solution looked like this. It had a shock at X equals zero and is just piecewise linear. And so now we can compute these structure functions, which are related to the definition of the norm in this space as we saw last time. So we compute these structure functions by integrating over space the increments. And just using this exact formula, you can perform this integral if there's a single shock, okay? And if there are multiple, then you can do it in a similar manner. Um, but if there's just a single shock for simplicity, uh, you perform this integral and you, and you find that um, you, you, this, is, this is inequality. And now, as you send the scale L to zero, you see that there's uh, two different regimes of behavior. So either, um, either this dominates, which is the case when P is less than one. So here there's a fixed L. So, is, so, so basically this is linear uh, L and this is L to the power P. And this is not going to zero. This is like going to two L over T. So either when P is less than one, this part dominates and this is subdominant, or when P is bigger than one, this goes to zero faster and this is what's dominating the behavior at L goes to zero. So you have these two behaviors, either it looks like this or it looks like this and the prefactor is something like this. Okay, if you just introduce what the velocity jump is. So what that says is that if you measure how many derivatives it has, well, it's what I said above, but if let's just plot it 
in in uh, let's plot this exponent, which is the exponent for this thing. So this is L, L to the zeta p. Let's plot this exponent, which is given here, on the same plot that we had before for the Kolmogorov theory and from the data. So recall that Kolmogorov for for Navier-Stokes predicted that the behavior would be a straight line with p over three. Okay. Now for Burgers, we see um, a straight line behavior up to p equals one. And then from p equals one, this exponent is just unity for all p. It intersects the Kolmogorov theory at p equals three. So this should be actually right here. This is p equals three, which is that privileged exponent related to the flux of energy through scale. So p equals three is actually fixed to be one by uh, the analog of the Kolmogorov for Fis law for Burgers that just says that the nonlinear flux has to match the dissipation due to viscosity, which is non-vanishing. So for Burgers, you can actually show that's the reason why this is fixed at one. Um, this, but this the point is the same in all dimensions then, right? For Burgers. Yeah, so for Burgers in higher dimensions, um, it's, it's a slightly separate discussion. So usually you study that for uh, irritational solutions of burgers in higher dimensions. Um, and I think there, yeah, it's the same point. Um, yeah, that's I'm, the same. No, I, I'm just saying because we have P equals three, you were talking about P equals three in three dimensions also. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's right, yeah. So P equals three, that point is the same in all dimensions. However, um, well, this is a bit of a technical point, but to relate that flux directly to this space here is something that can be done in one dimension, but it can't be precisely done in higher dimensions. So there's a slight disconnect between the four-fifths law and saying that you have exactly one-third derivative in L3. And the disconnect is related to the fact that in general, the nonlinear flux involves some direction of the velocity vector field. It's some velocity vector, um, velocity um, difference in some given direction. In fact, Kolmogorov originally de de derived it for velocity um, differences that were in the direction of their separation vector. So that was called the longitudinal um, structure function. And because of that, you don't actually have this precise connection between being in a certain function space with uh, some number of derivatives, except in one dimension when you have it because you know the directionality is then trivial. So you can relate it directly to this. But okay, that's maybe shouldn't talk too much more about that. And so let me say that what I described just now is trivial. I mean, it's just an exact solution and we can analyze it exactly. Um, but actually everything I said essentially holds in what, what you could consider the, the mathematical dream framework for studying turbulence, which is to consider this equation with some white noise forcing this is just a choice, but let's say some forcing, in this case, let's choose to be wide in time and have some spatial correlation, then works by Wayne and Er, Kahnen, Mazel, and Sinai um, in the late 90s, early 2000s, they show that there's a unique invariant measure, which is supported on entropic shock solutions of the inviscid Burgers equation and that the invariant measures of the corresponding viscous equation converge to those invariant measures, and you have all these features, anomalous dissipation and intermittency, can be understood in this statistical framework here, which is you know, what you would love to show um, in the Navier-Stokes equations, for example, governing hydrodynamic turbulence. Okay, and I'll just point to this really nice review on the subject, talks all about different aspects of the Burgers equation, and um, th there's been a, a lot of work there. I can't hope to uh, really describe it all. Okay. Are there any questions about this? So would you say that we should expect this picture 
for the Navio Stokes, even though you can't, it's beyond out of reach to prove it, but uh, with this dream picture. Um, that the ent entropic yeah. similarities, uh, can, you know, control the structure sort of. I, I guess in some ways, yes. In other ways, no. Certainly one thing that I expect to be different about Navier Stokes. Tell me what's the same. I don't care what's different. I want to know what's the same. So I. Conjecturally. I want to learn. Conjecturally. About... Yeah. So conjecturally, I, I guess. I, I, I think that some of this picture, namely some invariant measure on weak solutions of Euler might, I mean, it's difficult to say, but maybe that there is some, some class of weak solutions of the Euler equation, which are non-smooth, and there's some invariant measure there, which is the limit of viscous measures. I don't know about uniqueness, and that invariant measure would characterize or capture these properties of anomalous dissipation and intermittency. So these would be things that you could sort of understand from the point of view of that invariant measure on the weak Euler solution. It could be completely wrong. There are certainly some indications that Burgers is very different than Euler. One is to do with the well, wait, sort wait, of- wait, 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 I don't wanna hear that. I don't wanna hear that. I wanna summarize what you said might be the same. You said, consider Weak solutions, even to Navier Stokes, take their limit as viscosity goes to zero and hope that they converge. I mean, that you get some nice limits, weak solutions of Euler. And on all of this, there should be invariant measures that are supported on behavior that consists of uh, singularities and intermittency that fit with your whole ser set of talks, you might say. Yeah, yeah that's, that's right. I mean, I want to think of a positive viewpoint because this is like a dynamical system. I mean, even in finite dimensional dynamics, we go to the Lebesgue measure class and do ergodic theory. Well, if you have a measure, even in infinite dimensions, you're doing ergodic theory. And these are all questions that are natural and yeah. have highly studied, you know, BRS so, and so on. You know. okay. So let me, let me add, in addition, my next lecture will be on sort of sort of this topic, I mean, in a way, um, in, in two dimensions, and sort of understanding a bit more precisely and formulating some ideas about how these attractors and potentially these invariant measures behave as you send viscosity to zero. Um, so I'll, there'll be some further discussion about that next time. But yeah, I think everything you just said, Dennis, is, is in fact what the dream would be. And, and there is hope that that's true. Yeah. So what are, what is the definition of entropic entropic shocks? Uh, so just just shocks that actually uh, dissipate energy. So I mean, if you have the Burgers equation, for example, say without any forcing, monotonic you have a time monotonic in time. That's important, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. So only, if, if you what only dissipate, right? Only dissipate. Yeah. yeah. So if you have a jump discontinuity for the Burgers equation, um, you could have weak solutions that open that jump discontinuity up. Um, let's say, so, so Burgers, there's a difference between the left side being bigger or less than the right side. So if you have a jump where the left is bigger than the right, the entropy solution maintains that structure and dissipates energy at that point of discontinuity. There are other weak solutions that open it up and those would not be entropic solutions. Mm. Okay. This idea goes back to, to Riemann, no? Yeah, so, so this is the, the picture I just described is uh, related to the Riemann problem, which is about propagating this structure. Uh. So what equation did Truman look at? So, uh, uh, Euler? Yeah, I, I, no, not, not Euler. I, I think it was um, also uh, one-dimensional conservation laws. Mm. So um, th there may be some instances of those that are reductions from some higher dimensional system like Euler. Um, but he would look at, I think that that theory is really designed for equations like the Burgers equations. And, 
scalar equation in one dimension. There are ways in which you can uh, promote it to systems of equations in one dimension, but or, or even scalar equations in higher dimension. But thus far, the theory is really restricted to those cases. And if you want to do systems in higher dimension, in fact, many of the results that are known from that theory have been proved to be false. Like, for example, the, the sort of stability of these entropy type solutions, even if you look in the class where dissipation is happening locally. So that, as a consequence of some of that convex integration work I said earlier, you could show that some properties of entropic solutions in those special settings cannot be true for higher dimensional systems uh, with uh, higher, de higher degrees of freedom. But that just, okay. you, that just means you may, you, you have to search for more conditions than just the, yeah, that's, the, the Riemann condition, right? I mean, right, just right. a warning, it's not a, it's not a, yes. it's not a give up hope. But you no, know, no, it's, also, can, can I just say something? Uh, in your, yeah. when you mentioned Berger's equation, it was so obvious to you, you didn't say it. I don't think you said it, that Berger's equation is just Euler's equation where you drop the pressure term. You drop the constraint that is volume preserving, right? So, yeah. so I mean, so Misha, I mean, you are studying something derived in a simple way from Euler by dropping a constraint. Except that, and and in in one dimension, Euler's equation doesn't is collapses. It's too trivial, as it you know. But when you yeah. drop that constraint condition, it becomes an interesting equation. Actually, there's a slightly subtle point here. So as Dennis said, if you take a compressible system now, then then a Burgers type system emerges if you have zero pressure. So it's like a pressureless gas. But there is some small subtlety about uh, what happens to that picture as you go past the formation of a shock. Because when you propagate past the formation of the shock, you're actually using this entropic condition that energy is decreasing to continue as a solution in some sense, a weak solution in that sense. But actually, if you do that, um, then you lose the connection to the physical 1D Euler system because the physical 1D Euler system actually has a mass density that's evolved alongside the velocity. And the conservation law should be of the kinetic energy with the mass density included. So there are some, so what Dennis said is right, but there are some points um, that have to be thought about even, even with that analogy. But anyway, it's, but okay. So let's move on to the next. Uh, but when you said Euler in one dimension just then, did you mean compressible Euler? Yeah. So, I mean, Berger, yeah. So Berger's equation can be really properly understood as in this one dimensional case as a, as a compressible Euler system in one dimension with, with zero pressure. Um, so it, it, in that situation, uh -huh. you can eliminate the mass density for smooth solutions and just solve the velocity equation. And then you understand everything. And what I'm saying is that when a shock forms in the velocity, you really can't forget about the density. So you, you, if you want to interpret it as some weak solution of the original compressible Euler system with zero pressure, you, you have to re-include the density in your understanding. But that's, okay. but that's a completely different point. OK, so the next class of models that I want to talk about are passive scalars. So passive scalar is denoted by theta here, and it's just a, a scalar field on uh, the space, which is being pushed around by some given velocity field u, and it's being dissipated by this. This is the thermal diffusivity kappa. This velocity field, I'll consider it to be incompressible in keeping with pretty much everything else I discussed, except for the Burgers equation. Um, and Okay, we consider the Cauchy problem with, say, mean zero data. Now, what, what this is object... It, what, what is described? What is described by these equations? Oh, yeah. So, okay, so this describes the motion of, like, temperature, a temperature field, or dye by an incompressible oh. medium. Oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah. I see um, and a direct consequence of the equations of motion is that 
the scalar fluctuations or the scalar energy, energy just the L2 norm of the scalar can I, field. Can I, say, can I say, this is, again, you sort of always use these phrases that are so well known in your field, you don't say what they mean. The word passive scalar means it doesn't act back on the fluid. The fluid just acts on it. That's what passive means. And so it's just something moved with the fluid. So yeah. you use the phrase, you know, okay. <laughs> yeah. You no, get that, that's great true. talks and I've just, it, the deviation from perfection is so light that I notice it, okay? <laughs> so, yeah, so I, absolutely. And, and actually because of that, when you think of it as a temperature, you, you know, I mean, of course, physically, the temperature should the should affect the motion as uh, as you would intuit. So this is really an approximate description, but okay, it's a useful one, and there are regimes where where it's really an accurate one. So um, right, so so one consequence of this these equations of motion um, is that the scalar energy is dissipated monotonically by the, um, the uh, thermal diffusivity, just like the fluid velocity, you know, the fluid energy was dissipated by viscosity. So exactly the same sort of balance of energy holds for solutions here, as you would see uh, for the Navier-Stokes equations. And this is an obvious point, but I'll say it. I mean, even though the velocity doesn't directly appear in this balance, um, it has an awful lot to do with what, what's actually going on in this balance. And that's just because when you take some blob of scalar and you evolve it in time underneath the action of this velocity field, this blob of scalar will become very highly filamented. And when it becomes very highly filamented, it creates very large gradients. And that can compensate this very small diffusivity if you're considering that problem. Okay, so the velocity is really the main mechanism for allowing the scalar to sort of enhance its dissipation of energy. Okay, and just like in turbulence, there's an analogous anomalous dissipation for the scalar. It's just that this quantity, the cumulative dissipation of scalar energy is bounded uh, strictly away from zero uniformly in this parameter kappa, the diffusivity. And there's many um, works that show convincing evidence of this in various situations. I'll point to one paper by Donzis and Srinivasan in 2005 that discusses it. Was there a question? Yeah. Okay. So again, in parallel with Ansager and Kolmogorov's understanding of hydrodynamic turbulence, there was a similar theory put forward by Abakov and Corson slightly after those original theories uh, for the incompressible fluid. And just a caricature of what this theory says is that, you know, if the turbulent velocity has alpha derivatives in some sense, here I say C alpha, but maybe I mean the structure functions or, okay. Um, then the, the scalar in a turbulent setting should have uh, beta derivatives, uh, where beta is related to alpha according to this form. Okay, and we can actually understand this theory of Abakov and Corson by means of this um, sort of framework that we've developed over the last two lectures. Wait, well, so, what process are we considering? Fluids and Euler in 3D? No, th this is now for um, if you have any sort of turbulent velocity field that looks like a turbulent Euler solution. So uh, just say has alpha derivatives, maybe it comes from Euler, maybe it comes from elsewhere. Um, then the prediction of this theory is that- oh, I don't know what we're talking about. Oh, okay, yeah, so I'm, I'm- Yeah, I mean, what is this theorem? I mean, what process yeah. under under- yeah, so I'm, I'm talking about the, uh, sorry, yeah. I'm talking about the behavior of this system as, as diffusivity gets small um, when this velocity here is turbulent. Oh, okay? I don't, you don't suppose it satisfies some equation. It's just a rough velocity field. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay, yeah. like what you talked about at Stony Brook. In your yeah, talk. so actually I'm, 
I, I'm going to mention that result here just because maybe now there's some more context and it can be um, right. So, um, so, so here's one way you can understand these numbers, this relationship between alpha and beta here. Um, if you have a velocity field that has alpha derivatives, okay, and it's incompressible, um, and you have a family of uh, solutions of that passive scalar problem just being moved by the velocity and also dissipated by kappa, which is uniformly bounded in a space that contains that, that, that has beta derivatives, okay, then this dissipation is bounded by some polynomial or some power of kappa, uh, the, the thermal diffusivity, and this power is related to the number of derivatives the velocity has and the number of de the derivatives that the scalar has, like this. So in particular, if this beta were bigger than the number of Abakov course in theory, then this would necessarily go to zero. So you can understand this theory as just saying it's the minimal requirement uh, uh, such that this argument fails. So it's just saying that beta has exactly the level of uh, sort of, I mean, the scalar has exactly the level of regularity needed for this exponent to be exactly zero so that you don't contradict this thing remaining bounded away from zero as kappa goes to zero. Okay. And a, a, a slight refinement of this argument shows that if you knew in addition that the velocity was sort of well-behaved up until a single instant of time, um, which is quantified here by saying that it's Lipschitz L1 in time on this interval, um, but it's holder on the entire interval, so it maintains some alpha regularity for the entire time, um, then uh, this goes to zero if you're exactly at that endpoint case with equality. So in this setting, the Abakov course in theory would correspond to taking beta just less than one, plus, one minus alpha over two, not equal. Okay, and so until recently in the literature, there have been no rigorous examples of the phenomenon of this thing being bounded away from zero. Okay, there have been no examples of that. Um, at least in a deterministic setting. I, I want to say there are a few notable exceptions to this in uh, random models. So one very famous model where a lot of amazing results have been produced is the Kraken model, which is one where the velocity field that's advecting the scalar is actually a Gaussian random field and it's white noise correlated in time, and its spatial covariance is such that um, it, it sort of looks ideally turbulent with an inertial range, sort of a range where it's non-smooth that extends all the way down to zero length scale. You can cut it off and so on, but the ideal model is turbulent down to zero scale. And so in this model, people have studied this problem and analogs of this can be established, and in fact, much, much more can be established. So the real success of this model was in predicting the intermittency of the scalar field, which is something we talked about last time. But I'm not going to discuss that, but I give some names and I can provide references for this to those who are interested. And another recent advance, in, an exciting advance in this direction is a, a program that was sort of established by Jacob Bedrosian, Alex Blumenthal, and Sam Punch and Smith. And it's an ongoing series of works where they study these problems where the velocity field is random, but it's not necessarily a prescribed Gaussian random field, but it could be, for example, a solution of the Navier-Stokes equation with some random force. So the randomness percolates through the equation onto the velocity by solving it, and then you put that velocity in a vector scalar. And now you want to know behavior of the scalar in some statistical sense um, according to the measure that you're putting on the force of the velocity. And that problem is highly non-trivial to study. 
and um, they've made great progress in a certain regime, which is complementary to this one. So it's, it's actually a regime in which the fluid remains smooth, but you think about the scalar in some equilibrium at infinitely long time, and then you want to know the structure of the scalar field there. And so it's, it's, it's a slightly different setting, but it's, it's a very exciting direction. And hopefully it can lead to uh, more things also related to what I'm talking about here. Yeah, we'd like to know what the equilibrium distribution of the COVID virus will be. <laughs> it's moving up randomly right now. <laughs> yeah. Is it going to thin to zero or not? <laughs> okay, so here, here's a theorem about this. So this is a deterministic example of, um, of this behavior. So the statement is fix any time, positive time, any spatial dimension where, where the velocity and the scalar are living, um, any alpha between zero and one, and um, some initial scalar field that has two derivatives in L2. Then there exists a divergence-free velocity field U, which is C infinity smooth up until a certain instant. And then uh, on the entire interval, it's Halder with C alpha, this given alpha. And moreover, it's such that the scalar energy remains bounded strictly away from zero by some number chi, and chi depends on the initial data for the scalar and the Halder regularity of the velocity. Okay, so it's just an example showing that what we said may happen for Navier-Stokes actually does happen, at least for this constructed velocity field in the passive scalar problem, okay? And I think actually I was thinking about reviewing uh, uh, the proof here, but maybe I think in a few weeks there's a conference, so maybe I'll talk more about this there. I think there are some ideas that are also related to renormalization in the sense that the construction goes by increasing the number of scales in a certain way um, as time progresses towards this instant where, where things go bad, and then just keeping careful track of um, how the scalar responds to these higher frequencies of the velocity. So I'm, I'm going to skip the discussion now and I can talk more about it in, in that. And actually people from Stony Brook may have already heard, heard about it, so. Okay, so I'll, I'll jump right towards some open issues. So now that you know the statement, um, um, there are some issues that would be interesting to resolve. So the first is that the statement, remember, depended on the data. So, you know, given a data, you could find a velocity field such that the scalar remains away from zero, the dissipation remains away from zero uniformly in the diffusivity. It would be very interesting to construct a velocity field that works for all initial conditions, or maybe a ball of initial conditions in some space that's sufficiently broad. Um, and maybe in this direction, a good idea would be to think about randomizing the construction of the velocity and in doing so be able to handle a wider class of initial data. But then there's this issue about the Abakov course in theory. I guess I didn't mention this, but the theorem I described actually shows that the Abakov course in prediction is correct, um, at least for this solution that's constructed for the velocity that's given. So um, namely that threshold of how smooth the, th the, the scalar is, is exactly realized by the, the construction that we have. But a very interesting question is to ask if that remains true um, uh, over the whole range of that theory. Namely, if you have a velocity field which has alpha derivatives for some alpha in zero one, um, can you show that the scalar actually remains bounded for some velocity, it remains bounded in a space that controls beta derivatives, where beta is a number just less than the prediction of Abakov and Corson. So if what, you could establish- What does the superscript K mean on the thing? Oh, K means just it, it depends on kappa. So you have a family of solutions that depend on this diffusivity kappa, and you want oh. to say that uniform in that parameter, the solutions ha have you know beta oh. derivatives. Well, we assume we have the diffusivity term. Yeah. Yes. That's yeah. the smooth thing. Okay. Yes. 
And and moreover, you want to say that actually the you know that this dissipation on those solutions remains away from zero uniform in the diffusivity. And if you could establish this, then at least it would give some construction, some rigorous example of of the type of turbulent behavior that's actually observed. So maybe you can't connect it to the Navier-Stokes equations and put the whole picture together, but at least you have an example where this highly non-trivial phenomenon occurs. You see, this phenomenon is, is especially interesting because as you decrease the regularity of the velocity by sending alpha smaller, this beta prediction actually gets bigger. So alpha, when alpha is zero, this is one half. Uh, and when alpha is one, it's zero. So when alpha is smoother, the scalar retains less regularity. And when the, the, when the velocity is rougher, the scalar keeps more. And so somehow it's a counterintuitive statement that, the, that despite the fact that the velocity field is becoming very irregular, the scalar field's actually not that bad. It's actually got, gotten in. Is better. it really counterintuitive? I mean, you're sort of, you want the, 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 the diffusivity uh, is a martingale. It has no trend, right? Right. Right. So the right. U, the U is the trend. You have this random process, and U is sort of the trend, right? You're moving it. Yeah. It's the trend. So the if the trend gets rough, it might smooth. It might cancel the uh, diffusing. I, I don't know. It's yeah. Yeah. That's. I mean, that that would be the idea. But okay, I think maybe it's intuitive for you, but also it could be considered counterintuitive because. You know, just when you think about it from the point of view of solution theory of PDE, it sounds counterintuitive. But actually, I think what you're saying is the, maybe the correct way to think about it. It's not. Yeah. Um, anyway, I'll just leave it at that. Um, and then there's so I won't I won't talk about this because I didn't talk about the proof. So you don't know what this is about. So I'll just I'll just move on. Uh, so, yeah. Okay. Can you wrap it up in five minutes? So just. Oh, oh sure. Yes. So I, I think I'm almost done. So let me just describe some extensions of these ideas to other physical situations. So one is to include the effect of boundary. And so there's this very nice numerical work by Wynn, Farge, and Schneider, where they consider it just in two dimensions, a, a vortex dipole that self advects and moves towards a wall, which is at this bottom plate. That's a wall, a solid wall. And what happens is this dipole goes down, it hits the wall. And then at a certain moment for Navier-Stokes, these, these vortices bounce off the wall. But if you did a careful simulation of Euler, which is the right, these vortices just slip along the wall and go away from each other. So, and at, at, after this moment, the dissipation remains away from zero. So what it's showing is that if you have a solid boundary, two-dimensional fluids can behave in a certain way like three-dimensional fluids do without boundary. Uh, not in every way, of course, but at least in this respect, you can have this anomalous dissipation and you can have this very violent behavior. And typically when people think of two-dimensional fluids, they think this type of thing is impossible. But in fact, when you have a solid boundary, you can sustain it. And so some of these ideas have been generalized to bounded domains. Um, and th this way of thinking allows you to discuss the relationship between how things have to behave badly in a boundary layer compared to how things behave badly outside in order to sustain this behavior. So I won't talk much about it, but just I guess just to say that there is this way of connecting what happens nearby the boundary to what's happening in the bulk to, to make some sort of prediction about what's going on in a picture like this. Um, another issue that's related to this is just in general, can you identify some physical mechanisms that can suppress the type of behaviors we've been talking about, this anomalous dissipation, these singularities emerging? And this is of great value to, to, to pursuits like engineering, where if you have a pipe and you're transporting oil, you want to reduce the drag um, so that you can more economically transport the oil from point A to point B. And so because of that, engineers have thought about this problem long and hard, and they've, they've 
sort of establish two separate mechanisms, at least two, that are observed to do this. So one of them is to add trace amounts of polymer to the fluid. And here's the picture. If you have water without the polymer, the same, same pressure force between these two, same, same imposed force, the water goes here. With the polymer, it goes there. So you apply the same force, it goes much further. That's reducing the drag. And another one is rough walls. And there's some similar effects there. This one is, both of them are not very well understood. There's some work I, I did with a PhD student at Princeton, Jun Hyun La, which provides a model for this behavior where you can actually prove that it happens if you account for the polymer just near the boundary and not in the bulk. So that's a piece of the story, but not, not what's going on here completely. And then this rough wall, there, there are works by actually many authors, but typically it's only near very special flows, some special shear flows where you can say something precise, but there's no general picture of why, why drag reduction can happen. Okay, in the, in the remaining minute or something, I want to describe just one more phenomenon that's related. This is, I think, a very interesting thing. When you have a rough velocity field, as we've seen emerges at high Reynolds number, it has many consequences. And one of the consequences it has is on, say, the motion of particles that are displaced within that velocity field. And actually, Richardson, a meteorologist in 1926, did some experimental measurements of, I think, balloons in the atmosphere. And he came up with some prediction for how nearby particles should disperse. His prediction was that if you have two particles that are close in a turbulent flow, and you look at their mean squared dispersion, so you square their difference and average over, say, the domain, um, then this should behave like epsilon, the energy dissipation rate of the fluid, times t cubed. And here's some more modern numerical co confirmation of this effect. You can just see this is the epsilon t cubed line. And these are just particles that start at different initial separations and looking at their mean square dispersion, you see at longer times, they all bend over to this behavior. Now, the, the crucial point about this behavior is that on the right-hand side, there's no knowledge of how far the particles were at the initial time. And in fact, that's where, what's reflected here. These different initial separations all lead to the same behavior at a later time. And that's striking because the prediction is that as you increase the Reynolds number, you could take the particles closer and closer, and they would still disperse to the same distance according to this law. So it's actually related to the fact that if you have a non-smooth velocity field, trajectories in it don't have to be unique. And just to connect it, let's just have a toy picture of the Komogorov velocity as behaving exactly like L to the one third. And you take two particles in it, and a 1D model of this is say this evolve according to delta x to the one third. And that gives exactly this behavior here. But of course, this description is far from anything rigorous. It's just a toy way to understand what's going on. The key point is that in this field, it's just Holder continuous of exponent one third. There are non-unique solutions. One solution stays together for all time. Another solution splits. This is the behavior of the extremal solution that just splits immediately. Here's a picture of what's going on. And, and this phenomenon has now goes by the name of spontaneous stochasticity. And it was discovered in the Kreitman model, that model I, I mentioned before about the random velocity field moving a uh, scalar. It was discovered there in 1998 by Bernard Goetzke and Kupiainen. And there's been a lot of work following it. Um, um, I'll just mention that there's some recent work by myself and Alexei Malayabev and Artem Rybekas that connects this behavior to some dynamical system property of the ODE system. So there's some renormalized time that depends on the solution that if you enter into that time, the distribution on the space of non-unique solutions is related to the long time behavior of a measure that's evolved in some dynamical system. So you connect it to an SRB measure. So I can maybe say more about this, perhaps in that talk also. And the final word, uh, I'll just leave to Komogorov here. So 
this type of behavior could also happen in the space of velocity fields. It doesn't have to be for particles, but it could be for the Cauchy problem of the fluid. Two nearby initial configurations that are turbulent could spread to a distance that's in, independent of that initial separation, talk, which is related to non-uniqueness of the Cauchy problem. Again, because of the irregularity of what, what's going on. And this was observed in some toy closure model for turbulence by Kreikman and Leith. But actually, I, I was reading in the book, uh, Arnold and Kesson, um, there was a seminar Komogorov gave, and he listed eight problems. And I read this number eight, the last problem on th this that he listed. And he says that one should think about considering the conjecture that in the situation of five, and five is about studying uh, uh, small viscosity problems. So essentially everything we've been talking about, if you have a small parameter in front, in front of the Laplacian, those type of singular limits, that was five, deterministic singular limit. So he said, consider that situation um, and the possibility that in the limit, the dynamical system turns into a random process. And this is about the impossibility of long-term weather prediction. So actually, although it originated here in the literature, in this paper, it was envisioned already there that this could be um, a real physical phenomenon. Okay, so I'll, I'll just end there then. Thank you. Questions, comments? So let me ask Sasha Abanov. Sasha, you're still here? Sasha? Yes, yes, yes. Just wondering how much of this mathematics resonates with, with what physicists are doing and in the way the physicists are thinking. So, is oh, it... I mean, physics is big. Denis uh, Bernardo is physicist, the, the guy who uh, discovered this spontaneous stochasticity. So you have been working so, on dynamics, have you? So it is not on this, on, not on this mathematical aspects. I'm doing some. My fluid dynamics is very primitive from this point of view. It's just I'm interested in applications to condensed matter. So it's not, no, I, I, I don't think I can tell anything profound here. So. No, but just on the conceptual level. So your physicists are thinking totally different conceptual way or so, or is there is a resonance between? I, I mean, in this story, what surprising to me and what, what I, what I personally would like to understand is that when you have these solutions, which, which are like uh, generate energy from from nothing, right? So it's it's you, you start with some solution, and and because velocity is not is not smooth, uh, the the energy is produced, for example, or, or disappears in, into uh, nowhere. So can I model this as that there are some additional degrees of freedom, more microscopic, where initial energy is stored? And then as a result of exchange between these uh, degrees of freedom and the motion of, of a fluid, this type of solutions produced. So can it be that these unphysical solutions which do not conserve energy are actually physical obtained in some limit where there is some another storage of energy at, at microscopic level, which we do not see in this um, rough description, which is just fluid dynamics on, Earlier equations. That's that would be interesting constructions for me, but what I, I don't know any examples of those. So Theo, maybe you uh, can say something. Right. Okay, I, I can try. Yeah. So I think, as you said, and and also alluded to, if you if you start with say zero initial conditions for um, the Navier-Stokes equation um, without any force, then the solution remains zero. In fact, the unique Lorey Hopf weak solution is just zero in that case. So that shows that these Euler solutions that start at zero and start doing something at least can't arise as physical limits of Navier Stokes with no force. On the other hand, they do arise, you can think of them as arising as solutions of the incompressible Euler equation when you add a very small scale force or high frequency force, and then you're considering limits of those solutions as that force, the wave number is going to infinity. And so in a way, maybe you can think of that force as parametrizing some degree of freedom that's forgotten in this particular limiting regime. And 
maybe then solutions could be thought of as physical if there were really a limiting regime that you could think of them like that. Now, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I don't, uh, I don't know. I think maybe Sasha Schnurlman, he would have much better feeling about that. That's my answer, though. Could I, could I make a comment on this, on the exchange you just had? Because let, let me just, this is a complimentary remark about Sasha. I've been thinking about this problem for 25 years. And I'm one day in the office with Sasha, and he, 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 he said the sentence now that you, you missed, you didn't pick up on, that he said to me, and which actually, and, and it doesn't affect the correctness or incorrectness of your remark, but it gives a sort of poetic and physical feeling to it. See, that mathematicians never think of the still fluid, they think of it as zero. But Sasha doesn't think of it that way. He thinks of that still fluid is at the molecular level has a huge amount of energy, random energy moving around. It's available. And he just mentioned when he asked his question to you, he said, can you think of some extra degrees of freedom that explains this apparent production of energy as being, well, the energy is actually stored at the molecular level at the finer scales in the physical reality. And it, for some reason it's allowed to appear out of nowhere. And you gave an answer. You said, well, imagine you put in a mathematical force with high frequencies, but it's actually this process, which is always out of the mathematical discussion, which gives a huge opportunity for intuition. You know, it's not, I'm not saying it's adding a precise theorem, but you know, this energy is not going anywhere. I mean, it's still there. It's just hidden at the molecular level, randomly dispersed. So we don't see it in any average measurement. The still fluid has a huge amount of energy, you know, at the molecular level. So, and it's sort of, for so some reason, there could be some cracks in this still notion and it comes out. And you're saying, okay, put in a highly frequency, highly fluctuating force, and this may allow it to happen. But, you know, you can imagine, you know, this picture is missing from the mathematical view. I mean, and would the physicists have this the different view? And for the first time, I felt, uh, I could actually poetically think about this and understand it and then maybe not prove anything, but you know, the energy doesn't go, it's already there. It's in the, it's in the vacuum or in the, uh, it's in the state of matter, you know, it's there. Uh, I, I can give up some simple example. I saw amazing demo, like classroom demo in physics, which, ah. is, which is the following. There is a, there is a spring with, with, with some weight on it. And uh, what people do is that they just uh, oscillate the spring. So initially this goes like a like pendulum type of motion, but then slowly this uh, uh, translational motion goes into rotational motion of that weight and the springs just stops being just uh, oscillating this way. And then this rotational motion slowly goes back into oscillational and, and, and it starts oscillating again. So if I assume that I do not see rotations and I just see the translational motion of the spring, what I would see is that it, it, it's uh, from the still position, it, it becomes oscillating and then goes back to still position, which is roughly what you described from these uh, solutions. So what I'm saying is that maybe there is some rotational degree of freedom or some more molecular degrees of freedom where this energy goes to and then comes back. Uh -huh. Can I say a couple of words? Sure. Yeah. Uh, a couple of words. Uh, yes, uh, certainly we observe this thing because the real fluid like water at uh, about micron uh, scale uh, is uh, in the permanent turbulent motion uh, exactly uh, uh, stirred by the molecular motion. And uh, it is already micro, uh, micron, it's macroscopic scale. Uh, at this scale, we can see it just adding small particles, which are the tracers, and we call this Brownian motion. In fact, Brownian motion is not motion of the particles, it's the motion of the fluid. And the particles just are tracers who uh, make it visible. Uh, the uh, speed of these motions is, considerable, it is uh, uh, hundreds meters per second. 
so uh, I think uh, it is uh, the most important uh, thing which determines uh, the structure of the fluids. Uh, why the, the fluid like water <coughs> has uh, some strange uh, apparently <coughs> contradictory set of properties like it is uh, 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 almost incompressible like solids but uh, it uh, has no sheer elasticity like uh, gases yes so it uh, somewhere <coughs> intermittent in fact this uh, permanent uh, motion, like boiling of this fluid, uh, I, I think it is called second turbulence. Uh, it is uh, uh, the reason why the fluid has this property. So the fluid would uh, be uh, very, uh, would very like very much to form a crystal, but uh, these uh, uh, shear flows. Uh, uh, permanently break down the crystal lattice, so it is uh, so we can define a fluid like a, a solid, uh, like crystallic solid, in the state of permanent shear uh, flow, uh, shear uh, deformation. Yeah, so it is uh, one thing, and uh, it is uh, the. Uh, I think uh, it is all summarized in the theory of hydrodynamical um, fluctuations. Uh, which uh, is in the books of Landau Lipschitz. And uh, it is one thing. Other thing is uh, purely mathematical that uh, uh, if you uh, return to what we heard here uh, from Theo Drivas, uh, the constructions of these strange uh, solutions include a very, uh, the series of uh, strong, uh, ever stronger <coughs> external forces having ever a smaller space scale. Yes, so we can imagine the limit of this. Uh, it is uh, uh, some strange object, uh, which uh, is uh, as a distribution, it is a force, but as a distribution, uh, it is zero because uh, it is orthogonal to any uh, smooth function. So uh, this is uh, what uh, I uh, call for myself ephemerals, uh, such things. And uh, uh, they uh, are uh, not uh, uh, in the, described in uh, today's formal um, terms, uh, but uh, they are very well uh, uh, included in the framework of non-standard analysis. So we can see these examples as uh, materialization of uh, non-standard analysis, which uh, where the forces are non-standard, purely non-standard, but uh, result in uh, quite uh, material uh, motions of the fluid. And Sasha, you are right uh, that here, uh, of course, uh, we have some additional invisible forces in all cases, uh, so it is uh, no break of uh, materialism, but it is uh, uh, these forces are invisible uh, because they are uh, have zero scale. So they are uh, orthogonal to any uh, sensors, any linear sensors. Yeah, uh, uh, that's it. Uh, other questions, comments? Uh, well, Sasha, well, is, is this, uh, um, sorry, um, I have to put the video here. Is uh, what you were describing now, is that related to the work of Cyrilson? The, uh, very much. Yeah, the, okay. So this is the, the black, uh, I forget, black noise? Yes, or? yes, yes. It is uh, black noise, yes. I even gave a course of lectures in non-standard analysis where I finished with the uh, Cyrilson and Vershek theory. And how is, I, I don't quite see the, the how does the non-standard analysis come into this? Is it just a technical uh, tool to construct? Uh, you know what, uh, we consider a formal limit of these uh, forces 
depending on uh, parameter on the number of octave k, uh, when, uh, when k goes to infinity, it does not uh, exist in uh, real, any real sense, but uh, it exists in non-standard analysis. It can be take a given uh, me meaning to this uh, limit. Uh, because uh, uh, we can regard non-standard analysis as a uh, uh, maximally uh, strong uh, set of, li of limit passages. Uh, so, uh, uh, no, as a, a very uh, weak example is uh, the Banach limit. Uh, so, uh, we know that Banach limit is a construction uh, which uh, makes it possible to uh, uh, find a limit of any bounded uh, sequence of numbers. So uh, if you uh, consider any bounded sequence there, uh, Banach limit gives you a, a, a uniquely defined function. No, it was uniquely defined, but its definition uh, includes uh, infinitely many arbitrary elements. Uh, so, uh, to some extent, non-standard analysis is a uh, far uh, development of uh, such constructions like Banach limit. And uh, in particular, we can uh, define the limit of these, uh, obje uh, these uh, forces, uh, which becomes uh, more and more uh, small scale, uh, and uh, uh, we can work with them. Uh, uh, that's it. And uh, if uh, we uh, include them from the uh, beginning, uh, the situation becomes more clear. Uh, uh, yes. Other questions, comments? Yeah. Uh Was there a question? Uh, yeah, if not, let's. I don't want to. I want to give other people a chance, though. So. Okay. Before you adjourn, ask me if I have a, que a question. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, want to ask a question before Dennis? <laughs> I'm sorry, that's too, that's too... I, have to, I have to leave now. So thank you, Tia. So take care, everybody. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Uh, okay, Dennis, I think I think you can ask us the question. Well, Dennis, I cannot stay for your question. You will tell me later. <laughs> oh. Sasha, are you still here? Yes. Okay. Well, there's a lot of Sasha's maybe. Sasha Avanov, are you still yeah, here? Yeah, I'm here too. Yeah. yeah. No, that one day in his office, he gave me this image of re repeating some things he learned in graduate school from Kadanov of of uh, how the, the fluid is just, the fluid that we're studying is just this trend of, which is being destroyed by all the random molecular motion underneath at any boundary. And, you know, and, and a, lot of your, a lot of your things have been talking about that. But anyway, that's, uh, and then uh, Sashi Sherman was telling about how to imagine using uh, a more elaborate Banach limit to uh, formulate a space for that to live in. Uh, I remember, you know, Th Thurston has a really nice the classical theorem in differential geometry. He has a nice proof of using non-standard analysis. It was his discovery. Uh, anyway, but, you know, there's sometimes if you look at things a certain way, there's something beyond the way you're looking at it that's still there and you can extract something out. Anyway, so anyway, I have two, two questions. I have two question marks on my notes. This, did, there was something about two thirds and, or three halves. I forgot which one it was, that number. And then you, it's sort of appearing ubiquitous, ubiquitously. Can you say what it is again? Yeah. That Two thirds is the. Um, the oh, um, that wrong. Two, two, no, no, two, two, yeah, two thirds. That's right. Two thirds. So right. that's that's the um, B 
behavior of the second order structure function. So when you just square the velocity increment and average, yeah, um, that's the behavior that it has in the scale L as a power in the inertial range. So it goes like L to the two thirds. Okay. And then that was that's that's in dimension three and in something in dimension one also. You observed it in two right. places. Right. So in in uh, dimension one, the, the the it's not that. And so I think you're talking about for the Burgers equation, and in dimension one, it's it's actually um, uh, bigger than two thirds for for p equals two, um, but it, it it's observed in dimension three. Yeah, but you seem to be observing it in another place besides the place you had observed it before. Then you talked to maybe that. that was maybe at p equals three, and that was the number one. That's where it was shared among both the one-dimensional example and the three D example. All right. Okay. So then my other my other question is, you you had you made a comparison between something happening in the bulk and something happening near the boundary. And yeah, uh, could, so, you, could you say that again? Because this, this of course, is a big theme in theoretical physics, <laughs> the boundary correspondence between two theories, uh, <coughs> you know, low energy version in the vault and high energy version and the boundary are in a correspondence. And this is a big pattern that's being observed. I was wondering if, the pattern you mentioned that felt like that was had any possible similarity, but what was it? So first just repeat what it was, please. Yeah. So it was concerning a, a hypothetical turbulent flow in some container. And the, the distinction between the bulk and the boundary was really in the definition or the extent of a certain layer, which is some width, is some you know some region close to the boundary within a certain distance. And the statement was that if the fluid behaves a certain way in a bulk in the bulk, then the size of that layer where the dissipation could take place depends on sort of the smoothness in the bulk in some way. And so you can relate. So if, if you smaller, take as your fund smaller as the roughness increases, or what? What way does it go? Yes, it's smaller as the roughness increases. Uh, or sorry, um, the, the reverse. Um, it's larger as the roughness increases. Oh, it's larger if the roughness increases. The boundary. Yeah. Oh, of course. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah. And there's actually a there's a physical theory by Blasius, which predicts that essentially the, the dissipation of the fluid actually goes to zero in a certain layer around the boundary, but in the bulk, it's non-zero. And the status of these things is, you know, something that's not co completely clear, but, but he has a theory that says that. And the, the width of the boundary layer in his theory is actually just the Coma Grove scale. So it's like, the viscosity to the three fourths, roughly, it behaves like that. And so, there's what, this picture that a, three and two, three with two dimensional three three dimensional bulk. Three no, actually the bulk no everything in uh, yeah could be three yeah could be three dimensional bulk, but you could also think about this picture in two dimensions, and the behavior may not be very different there. The thickness was the viscosity to what power about the square root. No, it's a three fourths. So the square root corresponds to the Prandtl theory. Yeah. Um, but this is a different statement. So the Prandtl theory has to do with essentially a, a region near the boundary where the fluid is um, moving. Um, moving and it's, it's necessarily viscous. I mean, you need the viscous behavior to understand how it behaves in that region. Yeah. Due to the one half, for example, but then away from that, the the idea is that maybe it behaves like Euler, and you know, an inviscid fluid, and you sort of match these together. That was Prandtl's boundary layer idea, and this is a slightly different thing. This is about a turbulent fluid in a container 
and it's about the behavior of the di dissipation where it's taking place. And in this Blasius theory, there's sort of a region away from the wall where it's taking place and nearby the wall, it's not taking place. And there are some experimental support of this in the taylor Coet problem when you have like this, um, like an inner thing that's rotating and an outer thing that's rotating and there's a fluid in between. So a three-dimensional geometry. And there's some indication that this type of behavior is actually seen there. But um, anyway, that's what, that's what that was about, the discussion. And that, that has uh, the exponent three fourths. Yeah, the Kolmogorov scale is the exponent three fourths, and it's related there. These are situations, by the way, in which you wouldn't expect the Prandtl description to hold. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I always think of Prandtl as being the uh, the kind of consolation prize because we have an inconsistent math discussion where you have different boundary conditions. <laughs> you have the no yeah. condition in Navier Stokes and you have the tangential condition. And so exactly. if they're accurate, there has to be an accommodating region, like our department hiring meeting today. There are two different viewpoints. <laughs> it was never resolved. <laughs> But by, by the way, one thing that I found very striking was that numerical, I don't know if I could, I could flash it again if people are interested, that picture from I'm the numerics. Yeah. Let me, let me flash it again then. So there's this picture here, um, which is just in two dimensions. So this behavior without boundary in two dimensions couldn't happen. But what, what you see is this very smooth vortex dipole exhibiting extremely singular behavior because of interaction with the boundary. And it shows that there is actually a, a major disconnect that happens because of this mismatch you're talking about. I mean, oh, the fact that- no Wait, the dipole hits the boundary and it splits into two pieces? Yes. Yeah, it splits like this. And the Euler solution, which is- Half dipoles. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. So. So. Well. Okay. So th this is Euler, and this is Navier Stokes with very small viscosity. So. So Euler in two dimensions is perfectly well defined system for all time, and what happens for that system is the dipole splits into two halves. Yeah. But for Navier Stokes, what happens is the dipole splits into two like lopsided dipoles, and they they look completely different. Oh, the di oh, I see, it splits apart. Oh, yeah. I oh, the local average is still zero, sort of, in the Navier. Sort story. of, yeah. yeah. Sort of, yeah. Oh. And that, and was, so, and that was in the this, 2011 paper by uh, Nagorin, yeah. and Farge, and Schneider. There's yeah, they, yeah, yes. And I mean, it, it just shows that. You and know, as it is the same as the Nagoyan who worked with you? No, no, different one. Okay. Different one. Um, so it just shows that um, in this case, Euler, I mean, if you, if you think of the physical system as being governed by some slightly viscous flow, even though there's well posedness on both sides of the aisle here, there's no, there's no difference in terms of the solution theory in a way. The, the actual behavior of the solutions is highly sensitive to the small viscosity. And in fact, there's no correspondence between Navier-Stokes and Euler after a given time. Now, it could be the case that this is still described by a weak solution of Euler, which is singular. And in, in fact, that, that may be true, but. Oh, that's true because the, it's weakly zero if you have a very crude measurement because the average is zero there. Yeah, maybe these filaments are, yeah, maybe they, yes, it could be. Yeah, but, but here it's not weakly zero. So that not a weak limit. No, but it, see, there, there could be many weak solutions of Euler that differ from this strong solution um, if, they, if they're less regular. 
Oh. So it's... So essentially what I'm saying is that maybe this inviscid limit behavior is actually landing on some other weak solution of Euler that's doing something very different than this classical one. Um, sorry to in interject, but the tech guys are asking me if they can oh. stop the recording. So oh, well, pop, we, pop recording, but don't turn it 